any uh, first time visitors this morning? Way back in the back, where y'all from? Where at? South Dakota? Okay, good to have you. Anyone else first time? Right here in the center, where are you from? South Carolina, what part of South Carolina? Oh, okay, around Clemson. Okay, good to have you. Anyone else? Right over here. Missouri? What part of Missouri? Boot Hill. I grew up just on the other side of the line there, outside of Joplin, on the Kansas side. So I'm familiar with the Show Me State. I had a first sergeant, he was from Missouri. He always wanted to remind us he was from the Show Me State. And we couldn't stand him, but he was uh, he was the worst first sergeant I ever had. But anyway, he was, he was an air winger and he hated grunts, so that worked out well for us. Uh, anyone else? Uh, no one else. Okay, let me get my pen again. All right. Well, it's good to have y'all. Uh, we had that study last night, um, Galatians 4. You can find that at, at Learn Bible 1611. Not calm, I think it is on YouTube. Uh, that's the YouTube channel. We'll have another one beginning of next month, so it'll be the first uh, Saturday in September, whatever that is. Seventh or first? Sunday, okay, seventh. So September 7th, that'll be our next one. We'll be in Galatians 5. Okay, well, it's straight up 10 o'clock. So, Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? So we left off last week. It was in Romans 9, 26. And it was Paul quoting back from Hosea. If you remember, we talked about that dual application from the scripture. He says, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, you're not my people. <clears throat> there shall they be called the children of, of the living God. So we see, uh, I, I showed you last time how Paul applies this thing practically to the church, but doctrinally that thing is, is uh, applying to Israel at the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the nation is going to be reborn. That's Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones, many other passages in the Old Testament. But you have to be careful, like I said before, when you're studying the Bible and you have to understand the different um, applications of Scripture. Um, because if you're... If you're too rigid in one way or another, you can be, begin to get pulled off into things that are not, uh, not going to be edifying. And so uh, what he does here is he applies what's said in Hosea chapter 2, and he applies it here to the church practically. And we went back to the book of Acts and showed you those things. And uh, so let's continue on here, though, and look at uh, 927. He, he's, he's taking another verse out of Isaiah. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, he, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Okay, so he, notice that right there, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. So they're going to be a great number, okay? And let's go back over here to Genesis chapter 22. Let's go to back to Genesis 22, and verse 17. This is right after Abraham takes Isaac up to the top of the mountain. And that promise seed, which is Isaac, right? Now look at it says in verse 17. Well, look at verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, 
By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Now, how many sons did Abraham have? Two, right? We talked about this before. Which, which one did the Lord regard? Isaac. Not the son of the bondwoman, but the son of the, right? Son of the, 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 the promised seed here, okay? But verse 17, he says this, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates, the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Notice the obedience. So worship is connected with obedience and sacrifice, right? Obedience first and sacrifice. But who, who's his seed? Who's he talking about? Well, let's go to Galatians 4. Let's look at the spiritual seed. Or Galatians 3, uh, rather. Look at Galatians 3, 16. Notice the 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made... He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So there's the promised seed, all right? And so the, the promised seed is going to come. He's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, right? So all the, the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through that seed, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, let's go to John 12, look at 24 on that note. John 12, 24. John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth, alone, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So you see how the seed, the death, the burial, the resurrection is what he's talking about there. And he bears much fruit. And all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed through Abraham's seed, right? All right, so we got the stars of heaven, and then you have the sand which is upon the seashore, okay? So you have two different things. You have a stars, the stars of heaven, and you have the sea, the sand. So we have two different bodies, as, as Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, remember? You have celestial bodies. I think I spelled that right. And you have terrestrial. So you have bodies in the heavenlies. All right, you have bodies down here on the earth, okay? You have temporal And you have eternal. That eternal seed is as the stars of heaven. Showed him a promise. But this sand down here, that terrestrial seed, that physical seed of Abraham, are they going to inherit the land? Yes. They're going to reign with Jesus Christ. However, not all that sand is going to make it. Now let's look over here in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Now, what was the big thing when the Lord came the first time? What was the, what was the Jew bragging about? They're the children of Abraham, right? They're his physical seed. They're bragging about their lineage. Well, let's look what they built their house upon. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Very familiar passage. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Notice that, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon a, on what? On the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the Winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and, and great was the fall of it. Now, what happened to the house of Israel after they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ? They fell. 70 A.D., Titus comes down, sacked Jerusalem, right? It was a great slaughter because they rejected the Lord Jesus. What did they build their house on? Sand. So you can see that right there. When you build your house upon a man instead of the man Christ Jesus, 
when the winds blow and the floods come and the, and the troubles come in your life, you're going to falter. You're going to fall down because you built your house upon the sand of the sea. You built it on some other man other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we understand who the rock is, don't we? That's the Lord. He's the foundation. He's the sure. He's the tried stone, isn't he? You don't build your house upon sand. Ask those over there in, in England who tried to build those castles in marshes. Those things would sink. You have to build it upon bedrock. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as many as the sand in the sea, yes, but they're going to be whittled down. You remember Gideon? How many Gideon start out with? 30,000. Somebody said it. And then it whittled down to what? Well, he whittled it down to 10,000. And then finally, he whittled, whittles it down to 300. You see that remnant? And that remnant that's going to be left is the ones that believe. Let's go back to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Look at Romans 9, 29. Now, he's making a comparison here, right? Still talking about Israel. Romans 9, 29, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been like, or been as Sodom and been like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then that the Gentiles, which follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law, or uh, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, here it is, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. So who's the stumbling stone? Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Now he's quoting from Isaiah. Once again, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 8. Look at Isaiah chapter 8. Let's look at verse... 13. Isaiah 8, 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts. Okay, so Sabaoth, you'll see the New Testament, that's hosts in Hebrew. Okay, when you see the Lord of, Lord of hosts, it's the same as Lord of the Sabaoth. Okay, it's not Sabbath, it's, it's hosts. All right, so he says this. Uh, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary... But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Notice this in verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among who? My disciples. That's the only time in the Old Testament that word shows up. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now, remember that priestly prayer the Lord has in John 17? The Lord gave him some, didn't he? He gave him those disciples. Right here in Isaiah is where you see it. But notice that. He says, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. What's that law? That's what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 9. That's the law of righteousness. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his righteousness, you, you, believe, you take his righteousness. He's made you free from the law of sin and death. And it's given by faith. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3 again. How do you receive the word? How do you receive Jesus Christ? By faith. <clears throat> Galatians 3.14 That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, not the works of the law. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trusting Him, trusting in the rock. Okay, so what's the, what was the Jews' problem? They sought it not by faith. All right, they, did, they would not hear the word of God. They would not hear his voice. Look at back in uh, Romans chapter 9. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling, block, or stumbling stone 
and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay. So we went through this before. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 28 now. Notice how, how much I'm going back to Isaiah. Much to be said about the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 28. Look at Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Then that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. That's strong meat, Hebrews chapter 5. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What's that? Scripture with Scripture. How do you want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ? You don't get it from the Talmud. You don't get it from commentaries. You get it from comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now watch this. For with the st stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom, to whom he said, this is the rest where you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Notice that in verse 11. All right, notice that in verse 11. Now when does that take place? Anybody know? All right, go to 1 Corinthians 14. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. This is the gift on, or this is the, the rules on the speaking of tongues, which is another language. Notice what Paul quotes here. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. Yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that which believe. Now notice he's quoting Isaiah 28. So what you see in the, in, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, when they start speaking in other tongues, other languages, it was a sign to Israel, saith what? Saith the scripture. To compare scripture with scripture. That's what he's talking about in Isaiah 28. Go back to Isaiah chapter 28. To whom he said, this is the rest. He said, come, on, come unto me, all, the, all you that labor, and I'll give you rest, right? Where my, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Once again, they would not hear the word of God. When he came to them and preached, they would not hear it. Why? Their, their ears were dull of hearing. Isaiah 6.10. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And that they might go and fall backward and be broken and be ensnared and taken. Now what is that saying? It's saying that if you will not hear the word of God, God with the same word can deceive you. You understand? So you can come up with any heresy out of the word of God. If you don't want to believe the book, He'll let, you, he'll let you believe a lie, won't he? Is that not what happens in 2 Thessalonians 2? Okay, we've been talking a lot about hyper-Calvinism, hyper-dispensationalism, some of them hyper-movements. Listen, they can find verses that can prove their theology. Sure, but they'll be blinded because they've got an idol in their heart. Just like that, that Jew was blinded with the idol in their heart. He said, okay, fine, I'll blind you with the same book. It'll be a snare to you. It won't, be, it won't be health to you anymore. It'll be a snare. All right, looky here. Now, so, so he says this, and they'll fall backward and be broken. So I showed you this before. So first you got the stumbling. What did they stumble at? The stumbling stone, right? Then they fall. And then they're diminished. All right? That's what took place in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. They stumbled, they fell, then they're diminished. <clears throat> look at Romans 11. Hold your place in Isaiah 28. But look at Romans 11. This is so important for you to understand your Bible. These next couple chapters we'll get into here are essential to understanding that. Look at 
Look at Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. For to pro provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness now? Are we a rich nation? Right? Predominantly made up of Gentiles, right? So the physical blessings and all the richness and fullness, all that, all those things that Jew was supposed to get because they rejected the rock, God said, okay, I'll give it to somebody else. For what? For what purpose? To provoke them to jealousy. Now, I'm sure none of you have any exes that you wanted to provoke to jealousy. You know, started going to the gym or something like that. You know, you, right? Well, look at me now. Look what I've done. Right? So you can see the, the correlation there, provoking that Jew to jealousy. When we start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Jehovah, and that the Lord Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the flesh, you think that makes a Jew mad? Good. Might cause him to get in the Bible and study it. That's the purpose. When you start poking that bee's nest, good, I hope it does provoke him. I hope it provokes people to get into the book. Saying, what's he talking about? Well, read it for yourself. See what it says. All right, so look back at Isaiah chapter 28. Wherefore, uh, verse 14, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which, which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we've made a covenant with death and with hell, we are, are, are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and understood falsehood have we hid, hid ourselves. Now when does that take place? They believed, they believed a lie. God sent them a strong delusion. Notice who they made a covenant with. Death. Now, what's one of the horses, the riders, called in Revelation chapter 6? You got death and hell followed with him. And that death is, is Satan personified. They make a covenant with that Antichrist. In the midst of that week, we'll get into that if we teach Revelation. You'll see it right here. In the midst of that week, he'll break that peace deal with him. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman in travail with child. That's what he's talking about. Okay? So because they rejected him, look at verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I lay in Zion for a, for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. That's what he's quoting in, uh, in Romans 9, 33. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All right, so he's talking about how God dealt with that Jew. You see the transition. Now we come into Romans chapter 10, the great chapter on salvation, right? Romans 10. Now, what's the number of the Gentile? Number 10. That's the number of the Gentile. All right, so here's where we get grafted in. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, did, did uh, Paul practice what he preached? His heart's desire was to see his brethren be saved, right? Remember, he goes down to Jerusalem, and the Holy Ghost told, tells him not to go, but he had it set in his heart. He's ready to die for that cause, wasn't he? But God said, you're going to Rome. Now, he writes Romans before he goes to Rome. And before he goes to Jerusalem, he writes in that letter, this letter right here, but he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm ready to die for it. And sure he was. But look at this, at verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going, to, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So when Jesus Christ shows up, the righteousness of God shows up on this planet. It was, no, it was no longer going to be the righteousness of them keeping that law. It was going to be all based upon what they did with Jesus Christ. And so it is for you. What do you do with Christ? Are you going to stand at the judgment, the great white throne on your own righteousness? Or are you going to put on Jesus Christ and be forgiven of all things? Because he's already completed the law. He already fulfilled that law. Okay? So, but they're going about to establish their own righteousness. All right? Their do's and their don'ts, their, reg their rules and their regulations. All right? But you remember in the Old Testament, yes, they had the law and it was given for transgression. 
But when they transgressed, what did they have to put their faith in? Blood. Blood of bulls and goats. But what could not what could that not do? Could not take away sin. Because it had to be the Lamb of God. Because the blood of bulls and goats is not eternal blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, which is God's blood, is eternal blood. Therefore, it can take away sin eternally. See the difference? So they're putting all their faith and confidence in those ordinances and sacrifices. And the whole time, those things were just nothing more than types of the real thing. And when he shows up, what did John the Baptist say? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, that righteousness which, is of the, which was of the law was done away in Jesus Christ. Okay? But that's what they put their trust and faith and confidence in. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, Paul got into a lot of trouble preaching both Jew and Gentile, didn't he? That's why he gets thrown in prison in the book of Acts, because he went down there to, the, to Jerusalem, and he preached to them about Gentiles also getting saved. And at that at that point, I think it's in Acts 21. Let me turn to it. <clears throat> I think it's Acts 21. No, it's not be 22. Acts 22. Look at Acts 22, verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple... I was in a trance, and I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee, out, uh, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the, and the, when the blood of, thy, of the martyr Stephen, thy martyr Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of, of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart. For I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Notice this, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. What was their problem? Notice that the what word, they gave him audience until he did what? He mentioned that Gentile. They didn't like that. They said away with him. Now I'll go to Ephesians. We went over this a little bit last night. Ephesians chapter 3. This is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 3 1. He's talking about a habitation of God in chapter 2. He's talking about the, the, the building of God, the household of God in verse 19, 2 19. But he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of, the, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. That's why he was in prison. Right there in Acts 22 is where you see that. They didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that the house of God was going to be made up both of Jews and Gentiles. Because the Jew at that time, they probably still do, they looked at us as what? Dogs. But how do we get in? By faith. So what did the Jew have to see? Signs, wonders, and miracles, right? All right, well, let's look over here in John chapter 4. Remember the woman at the well, Samaria? Everybody knows that story. Very familiar, right? So she goes out and she begins, after she believes on the Lord, she begins witnessing to all the folks in the village, all the other Samaritans, which the Jews would have nothing to do with. Look at John 4, 30, 39. And many of the Samaritans of the, that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever I did. Any signs, wonders, and miracles? Nope. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard this ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, anybody that knows anything about Samaritans, what did they have as far as Scripture? They only had the first five books of Moses. That's the only thing that they would recognize. Was that enough to get them saved? Sure was. He said, I'll rise, raise up a prophet like unto me. Hear ye him. And they heard him, didn't they? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There was no signs, wonders, and miracles done to those Gentiles. They just believed at his word. 
How'd you get saved? You believed his word. All right, go back to Romans chapter 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. They believed on him. Look at verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what, say, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Now we got Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, right? Very familiar, famous passage in Romans 10, 9. There's salvation right there. But let's look at let's look at the passage in the Old Testament, see how it differs a little bit in Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, because that's what he's quoting from. Notice how many times Paul quotes the Old Testament, and he makes application to the church. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to try to get through this in about 10 minutes. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Notice the doing, keeping the law. That was to keep them in the land. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it, bring it again unto us, that we may hear and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. See the choice? If they kept the land, or if they kept the law, they would stay in the land. If they broke the law, they would get expelled from the land. That's what happened under Nebuchadnezzar. 70 years of Babylonian captivity, same thing in 70 AD under Titus. They were dispersed, and they were not brought back until 1948. They were officially, they officially became a nation again, but he dispersed them. Why? They didn't believe God. They didn't do what he said. All right, now, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day, that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, what does the Lord say in John 14, 6? I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He set before him life. The stumbling stone showed up. There was life. In him is life. He is eternal life. And they chose death. They made a covenant with death. And with hell they were at agreement. Now, keep, now look at this, verse 20. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him now what's he saying John chapter 10 my sheep hear my what voice his sheep the ones that believed on him they hear his voice now what's his voice let's go back to Psalm Psalm 103 look at Psalm 103 in verse 20 Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. How are they going to be judged? By his word. The Lord Jesus in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh 
He is scripture personified. He's a walking Bible. You know what you're supposed to be out in the world? A walking Bible. Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Well, that means you're to be like Christ, correct? In your conduct and everything that you do out there, that might be the only Bible that people see is you. So you have a great responsibility, don't you? You think they're going to hear the voice of God if you're acting a fool? They're just going to say, well, there's another hypocrite in the church. The Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the Father 100% and did his word. But when he showed up, they did not obey the voice. Look, let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to skip down. I'm, not, I'm going to go back through it. But look at verse 16. But they have not all, all obeyed the gospel. They did not obey his voice. They did not believe on him. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. That's Isaiah 53. They did not believe the report of the Lord Jesus Christ from where? From the scripture. That's why when Paul would go into the synagogues, what would he reason with them out of? The scripture. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Some of them believed, but most of them did not believe. Why? Because they were messed up in their traditions. Well, we were talking about this last night uh, in the study on Galatians. One of the hardest thing to do, things to do is to pull people away from that tradition, maybe that they've been taught, and when you start to teach the Bible, the claws come out. And because you tell them the truth, you're now their enemy. It happens many a times. So when the Lord came, he came preaching what God the Father told him to preach. Notice what he says in John 4. When his disciples come to him, at that same occurrence at the woman at the well... Look at John 4.34... Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And he's going to make a short work on the earth, is what he said in Romans chapter 9, right? That's his meat. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. That's Deuteronomy 8.3. So he was doing everything to the will of the Father according to the Scripture. That is what guided him in his, in his direction. And his, his final destination was guided by the scripture, right? Now, what was the Lord's favorite uh, title to call himself? But you know, son of man, right? Son of man, son of man. He liked to refer to himself uh, as that above anything else. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1. You'll see this uh, phrase in Ezekiel more than any other book in the Bible. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me, and he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet. And I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children, <clears throat> and stiff-hearted. Remember what Stephen said to them? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, right? I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, that thou dost dwell among scorpions." Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed, dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. This is a good passage for preachers. When you get up here and preach and, pee, and, and you look at people's faces, be not afraid of them. And thou shalt speak my words unto them. Notice what he said, his, the will, his, his meat, right? What the Father fed him. Whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. 
And when I looked, behold, a hand was set, sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and it was written there in lamentations and mournings and woe. All right, so he's eating the words of God, and he said, Speak what I tell you to speak. Preach what I tell you to preach. Thus saith the Lord God. Now look over here. He, he goes through all these things. He says, um, look, at verse, uh, look at Ezekiel 3.20. He talks about putting a stumbling block before that righteous man, and he commits iniquity. He's, the Lord's going to put a stumbling block. Now, who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's going he's to trust his own righteousness. But look down here in verse 27. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear. And he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Now, you see that verse right there? He that heareth, let him hear. Where do you see that in the New Testament? Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation 2 7. He says of each one of the seven churches. No doubt this is doctrinally talking to that Jew in that tribulation. Look what he says in verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He says it seven times in the book of Revelation, just like he said in Ezekiel. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know how they're going to be deceived in the tribulation? By what they see. Because you know what the Antichrist is going to show up doing? Signs, wonders, and miracles. You know what's one of those disciples that went to his own place, that was baptized, that walked with the Lord, and he did signs, wonders, and miracles? You better base things off of what the book says versus what you see. Because Satan knows it's very easy to deceive people by what they see. It's very deceptive, isn't it? He said, say not here, low there. When that, when they're going to be looking for the Son of Man to return. He's going to say, don't look over there. Don't look over here. I've told you before. This is where you'll find me. Amen? So, on that note, thank God we got grafted in by belief only. Because we believe the Word of God, what it says where it says it. Amen? All right, thank you for listening this morning. We'll pick it up next week. Hopefully get through Romans chapter 10. Then we'll get into Romans 11, the grafting back into Israel, which is one of the great mysteries given to Paul. And um, we'll keep rolling along here until the Lord comes back. Amen. All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for liberty in the house today. Just pray for our pastor. Pray that you bless him, Lord, and uh, help him as he stands to preach one more time. And bless our choir and our choir leader. Just continue to fill them up, Lord, and just uh, prepare the hearts to receive the message. Lord Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.
It's good to be in the Lord's house, and uh, we welcome those this morning that's visiting with us. You are our honored guest, and as always, we want to welcome those that's tuning in by live stream this morning. Uh, before we get started, Sister Vivian has a couple announcements she needs to make. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this coming, um, coming up, this um, next Sunday, during Sunday school, we're going to have open house for our Sunday school classes. And the parents are invited to come. We want you to come because we want you to meet your child's teacher and uh, find out what they're doing in the classroom. We'll have light refreshments. And we're going to start at 9.50 and go to 10.50 in the morning. So if you have any questions, you can see me on that. All righty? And also, um, I want to announce that the uh, prom timers are canceling this event this coming Wednesday. And I think she, she said it would be on the 22nd. It's been changed to, set, I mean, to August the 22nd, okay? And so if you have any questions, uh, see Sheila or Mike on that. All righty. Thank you. All right, let's stand up, take the church hymnal, and turn to page number 401, page 401, The Unclouded Day. We'll do the first, second, last verse. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. for the creature. That's what that's about. Good to be here. I'd like to welcome you to the temple this morning. If you're with us first time, we'd like you to raise your hand and we'll give you a card. Let's fill it out. Drop it in a plate and it passes in a moment. Anybody first time with us today? All right. See a hand here, hand there. All right. A hand over here. And we want you to make yourself right at home. Hands back here. Amen. Visitors are special and honored guests. Man, you should feel welcome, Church of God, of all places. Right. You folks in the middle, where are you all from? Okay. All right, good. Good to have you. All right. Folks behind? Bowling Green. All right. Kentucky and South Carolina, good to have you. Over here on this side, where are you from? Missouri? Well, good. Good to have you. Amen. Folks over here on this side? 
Amen. You're home folk. God bless you. Good to have you. All right. Good to be here. Hallelujah.
best stand up and fellowship, shake hands with your neighbor as the choir comes down. Amen. angels were singing before we showed up. All you got to do is read in the book of Job. It's in there. Go ahead and have a seat and we'll have the ushers come up here to take up the morning offering. We'll meet again this evening, 6 o'clock for the evening service. I'll be kind of disappointed if we are here. Lord's coming back, folks. Lord's coming back. Amen. Brother Ronnie Crane, lead us in prayer.
Shelly Lee is going to sing for us. I thank the Lord for saving me and for dying on that old rugged cross for me. I thank the Lord for keeping me. He's been so good to me. I can't wait to get to heaven. Can you? Leave all these sorrows, all these things down here. It won't be like that up there. Y'all pray for me. Life has been so good, I can't complain. Cause when I'm down, God gives me strength to rise again. But I'm weary from the struggle of it all. How I listen, how I listen for his call. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. <laughs> Seems like lately it's always on my mind. Someday I'll leave this world behind. Heaven is sounding sweeter all the time. It's so hard to lose a loved one to the grave. But we have that blessed hope that Jesus gave. God's gonna wipe all the tears from our eyes. When we meet him, in that land beyond the sky heaven sounding sweeter all the time it seems like lately it's always on my mind someday i'll leave this world behind heaven Sounding sweeter all the time. That's good, Shelley. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles with me, I hope you have this morning, to the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of the most maligned prophets in the Bible because he has some of the uh, most powerful prophecies in the Bible. Quite remarkable that some of the things that Daniel says, chapter 9, verse number 24. But always remember that the Lord Jesus Christ called Daniel a prophet. Amen. He did. And since, my dear friend, he is God Almighty manifest in the flesh, I fully receive what he has to say. Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 24, here's what it says. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Father, bless this word now in thy name. Amen. Then he continues on with the definition of this, and it's quite a remarkable thing when you think about the fact that 500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, here we have a prophet prophesying to the very day that he rode that donkey into Jerusalem. So how do you get that? How many has ever heard of Sir Robert Anderson? Sir Robert Anderson was a British uh, intelligence officer. Uh, he, would be a, he would be what you would call a, a Sherlock Holmes. He, he was in Scotland Yard. He wrote a number of books. One was called The Coming Prince. And Sir Robert Anderson was very good with mathematic, mathematics. As a matter of fact, he has, and I have his paper here, all the calculations and formulas he used 
to come to the date of a April the 6th, A.D. 32, as the date that the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, which, of course, would bring you to the time of the cutting off of the Messiah, the Mashiach. Now, I'll leave this up here, and if any of you would like to see this, and some of you might be good at math, you'd like to work through this and make a copy of it and, and, and work at the information, you're certainly welcome to. Let me say this to you, and I've said it a thousand times, say it again. The archaeologist is your friend. Amen. History is not your enemy. Science is not your enemy. Science falsely so-called, which this world worships today, has a big problem. Amen. But I believe the Bible, and my friend, I believe it from cover to cover, and it does not make me think of myself as stupid and ignorant. I believe the Bible. So 70 weeks, the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, we find in the book of Daniel, chapter number 9. Now, on Wednesday night, you folks been coming, and you've been listening to some of the teachings that I've given. I told you how from the book of Daniel, chapter number 1, we have Hebrews, little young teenage boys that were carried away into Babylonian captivity, 586 B.C., by Nebuchadnezzar. And four of them, we have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They changed their names and tried to change their identity. They changed their diet and they wanted to change their gods, and yet they refused for that to happen to them. Amen. Now, make no mistake about it. That's exactly what they're trying to do to you today. They want to change your identity. They want to change your name. They want to change your God, and this is uh, something that you need to be aware of because the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge in the book of Hosea. So the ninth chapter of Daniel deals with the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, and just to accept this is a fact. That, set, that 500 years before Christ was born, this comes out and it can be traced right down to the very birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is an astounding thing. This is prophecy fulfilled. And I want to leave it up here for you because some of you may be interested in seeing that. We read in the book of Daniel of four successive Gentile kingdoms. 606 B.C. in the plains of Dura, Daniel had a vision. He interpreted the vision for the king. And it started with Babylon, then it went to the Medes and Persians, the Grecians, and then finally the Romans. And we know the Roman Empire was split in two. <coughs> you had the eastern section and the western section. And to this day, we still are dealing with the issue of the Roman Empire and its effect on what we, what we do today in our lives on this earth. So in the book of Luke, chapter number 21, I want you to turn there with me this morning, and we're going to jump forward quite a few years. And the book of Luke, chapter number 21, and verse number 25. Now, I, with no apology, say that I am a dispensationalist. And the reason I am, one of the reasons, is because the Apostle Paul said, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. A dispensation is a, spirit, a period of time where God deals with men according to a set standard rule, uh, a covenant, or whatever it is. And so these dispensations are crucial in understanding the Bible, in rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if we do not deal in the scripture in dispensations, then we have scripture sometimes butting heads appearing to counteract each other or you know what you have what have you all kinds of problems begin to develop and friend the problem's not the bible the problem's me daniel luke chapter number 21 verse 25 now look at this carefully with me and there shall be signs in the sun the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring now note carefully verse 26 men's hearts failing them for fear why Watch it answer it. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Obviously, then, the scripture says that something is going to be happening that causes men to fear and quake to such an extent that they would have a heart attack or heart failure. And this is what's coming. Now, you know as well as I do, in 2019, COVID-19 came out. Uh, most say that it came from a, from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. Now, who am I? I just read the news. You know, I read the papers like you do, so forth and so on. But the truth of the matter is millions of people died because of this plague that came on the earth. Millions. And it was quite a thing at the time for them telling you of all that were dying and showing you throughout the world the, the, you know, the, the, what, it was what it was doing to nations. And from that, certain things were put down upon this nation, 
and causing people to do certain things. And jobs were lost. Uh, kids were taken out of school. Some of them are still behind. And various things happened because of this. But what, 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 what I marvel at to this day and still do, and I hope maybe some of you do, is why that there was no really, there was real, really no concerted effort to find out where this came from and why it came upon us. If you have millions of people dying, don't you think that's worthy of checking into? That's a lot of people. So it causes me to believe that there might be a cover-up involved in this. And, of course, if we have that, then we get into the issue of conspiracy. They've already demonized the word conspiracy. So if you, are a cons if you believe in conspiracy theories, you're a nutball, and they, and they, and they, and they push you out uh, in the peripheral. But the bottom line is I will not let the news media, I will not let the government, I will not let it, this culture of today define terms to me and hang names on me. I'll still read my Bible, and I'm going to believe what I read in the scriptures that plague came from somewhere it had a reason in its existence and maybe in time we might find out but as we look at the bible and we read in the book of luke chapter number 21 we ask ourselves this question where does this fit what are we talking about here matthew chapter 24 the counterpart to it where does this fit how does this fit in the bible does that apply to us well the scripture is pretty clear about us when i say us i'm talking about the church of god the Lord Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to get us. Amen. And he tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians that we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. He's going to come and get us and carry us away. The apostle Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So this change has to do with something that's different. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle says, it's a mystery. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. So this mystery that the Bible's talking about in the New Testament, I told you I am a dispensationalist, and this has to do with mysteries, revelations from God. And so I'll accept what the Lord says about his body, his church, the church of the living God. Now let me explain to you what the church is not. The church is not a building, and the church is not a bunch of physical bodies. We got a bunch of bodies in here this morning. How many is in a body in here this morning? Raise your hand. How many not sure? <laughs> you see, this is 2024. We got people that don't know if they were female or a male or what they are, somewhere in between, headed from one to the other, what have you. In other words, we're headed off the deep end, folks. That's insanity. Okay? Get a hold of that. All of this transgender stuff and 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 and, and fluid trend, fluid identity, fluid genderism and all that is insanity. I don't know if you'll buy it, I don't know if you believe me or not, but you're all you've lost it. You've lost it. And so we're dealing with an issue of who we are, where we are, what's going to happen to us, and what, what the future holds. Now, how many of you in this house today feel inside your soul that, that it's just not the way it used to be? Now, we, we look at the signs of the coming of the Lord. And one of the signs, he said there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Well, we know that. We know right now that Israel's being threatened by Iran. We know that. And I don't know what's going to happen. Iran says they're going to strike them somewhere, somehow, when, I don't know. But we do know this. We do know that America has moved warships to the Mediterranean, and they are moving toward that area. We understand that. And so we know that at any moment, a war can break out. That's been my life, my lifetime. Been through that. I was in the military during Vietnam. So I understand all about wars. But there's got to be more. There's got to be more specific things that we can look at to, to identify the culture that we're living in today that would give us reason for concern to say, you know what? These are things that are not common in history. We cannot go back in history and pinpoint this. And I want to give you a few of them this morning, and I hope you listen to me. First of all is artificial intelligence. Okay? So what is artificial intelligence? Well, here's what they say. It refers to computer systems capable of performing complex tasks that historically only a human could do, such as reasoning, making decisions, or solving problems. Another says artificial intelligence is referred to as a machine intelligence, and it is rooted in binary codes and mathematical algorithms. Let me tell you something about an algorithm. I don't know how you use computers. I don't know how many of you use, uh, uh, you do search, you use search engines and you search the web. But I noticed in doing this that I 
typed in some phrases and some words to search on the internet and I could not pull them up. Now, how many of you are computer literate today? You're following what I'm saying. An algorithm has kicked them out. In plain words, the search engines have come along and said, uh, that's not important anymore. And so when you run your search criteria, uh, we're not going to give you a response to that. Somebody's made a decision. Now, I'm not saying that all search engines are like that. I didn't have time to get into all of that. D download a bunch of search engines. But you could not find them. It began to dawn on me that somebody was controlling access to information. Digest that for a moment. <laughs> Amen. They're controlling access to information. And so we have a situation going on here that uh, artificial intelligence, one definition or another definition or another definition, and the truth of the matter is I've, run, I've read a half a dozen of them or a dozen, studied them, prayed over them, and the truth is I'm still at a loss in a lot of what artificial intelligence really is. It's bigger than a computer. It's bigger than software. It's more than simply binary code. It has to do with something that is up here in the, in the mystery realm. Artificial intelligence is something that I think that even the creators of it are beginning to wonder, maybe they created something that's just a little beyond their ability to control. And that's the issue that's facing us this morning. This is why you get this warning. This is the report released this week by Gladstone, Alabama. Now this week, March 12, 2024, that's pretty current. Gladstone, Alabama flatly states the most advanced AI systems could, in a worst case scenario, pose an extinction level threat to the human species. Now some fellow down on Hay Boy Corner didn't say that, folks. This was said by the movers and shakers. Here's another one. AIs, quote, AIs could be used by malicious actors to design novel bioweapons more lethal than natural pandemics. You just went through a bioweapon. That's exactly what happened. That's right. Increase the ability. I forget the terminology they use. Gain of function. Thank you. Gain of function. Gain of function. Gain of function. In other words, make it much, 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 much stronger than its normal state. What does that mean? You're making a weapon out of it. We're making bioweapons today. Artificial intelligence. Now, here's some of the warning. Now, the date on that, June 5th, 2023. Here are some of the dangers of artificial intelligence. Automation spurred job loss. In other words, you may lose your job to a robot. We have this, uh, who's this man who builds the cars uh, uh, from South Africa? Uh, Musk. Musk is telling people now, he says, get ready for artificial intelligence. We'll take care of the manufacturing and the jobs and all of that. And this is what's facing people today. You realize what, a, what that's going to do to the culture, your culture, buying and selling your food where you live. Artificial intelligence, therefore, can be used for deep fakes. What's a deep fake? A deep fake is a photograph of you with a bunch of prostitutes and sent out to people and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blackmail you if you don't pay X number of dollars. This is a photograph of you with these prostitutes. Now, wait a minute. I haven't been with any prostitutes, you say. I haven't anything to do with any of that. Now, you don't have to. Artificial intelligence has the ability to put you where they want you. Artificial intelligence can take your voice and recreate your voice where even your wife or your husband cannot tell the difference. Artificial intelligence can put you in a video and we're just at the beginning of it. You wait till they perfect it. It's coming to the point now where in a court of law, and I know lawyers have been thinking about this, the rules of evidence as they say, what are they going to do in a court of law when you can no longer accept a photograph or a video or an audio recording? That's where we're coming to. That's artificial intelligence. I'm not talking about Disneyland. I'm not talking about theoretical. I'm telling you it's concrete right now. I'm talking about control. He makes those on the face of the earth that buy or sell to receive his mark in the right hand or their forehead. We're, the, the whole world's being set up, folks, for the mark of the beast. I don't know what the mark of the beast is. When we find out who the beast is, we'll get his mark. Amen. Amen. I don't know what it is, but I'm not worried about it because he's taking us away from here. Hallelujah to God. 
artificial intelligence, privacy violations. Privacy violations. You see, all of these things that can be used for good can all be also be used for bad. And for the sake of time, I mean, it take me all day to go through all this stuff. I think I'm getting the message over to you, am I not? Algorithmic bias caused by bad data, socioeconomic inequality, market volatility, weapons automation, and uncontrollable self-aware AI. That's scary. What's that mean? Sentient. It means that the artificial intelligence reaches a state to where it realizes it is an entity and it begins to make decisions on its own for itself. Yes. Oh, you say, preacher, that's wild. No, it's not wild. I'm telling you, if you'll do just a little reading and research on your own, you'll find out. Now, here's what Stephen Hawking said. And by the way, Stephen Hawking, he died with ALS. They told him when he contracted it in the 60s, he only had two years to live. Obviously, he lived for decades after that. And he was considered by many to be second only to Einstein in his intelligence. It's a very brilliant man. He said this. He repeatedly warned about the threat of climate change, artificial intelligence, population burden. Now listen to this one. And hostile aliens. Now listen to this. A study by Harvard social science researchers suggests that aliens may have been living on earth for a while. Didn't come from Hey Boy Corner. This came from Harvard scientists. And they say that aliens are possibly living on this earth now. Another research paper says, well, yes, to be, it's yet to be peer reviewed, suggests that life forms from other worlds could be living underground on earth or within the moon. And that UFOs and other unidentified anomalous phenomena may be evidence of them getting around. Now, let me say this about little green men on Mars. <laughs> there are definitely aliens out there, but they are not from another planet. They are demons posing as these creatures. You say, well, I don't. That's archaic. That's anomalous. Preacher, what are you talking about, demon? Don't you know we're past that? Well, the Lord believed in them. And he cast them out. And I certainly do. And the truth of the matter is, if you pastor a church for 48 years, you're going to look at a bunch of them sitting right out there looking right at you. Amen. I see you out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't kid me. I've been at this too long. You better believe it. Sometimes I can see somebody come in and I can feel a cold wind coming off of them. I'm really dead as they can be cold. Not just indifferent. The enemy of the gospel, cold. So aliens, oh yeah, do you believe aliens exist? Preachers, sure they do, but they're not what they think they are. They're, uh, they are, they are uh, spirit beings. Now, how many of you know what an old, old-fashioned ladder looks like? Just two poles with the rungs on it. How many know what I'm talking about? Just an old ladder. A lot of them are handmade. Take that ladder and twist it, all right? All right? And then take it and twist it up like this as long as you could possibly get it, continue to twist it until you come to the point to where throughout that ladder you have genetic structure developing. That genetic structure produces building blocks that literally make up what you are. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about DNA, the code of life. How many has ever heard of CRISPR-Cas9? Good. A lot of you to read. You check things out. What is CRISPR-Cas9? It is gene editing. What is gene editing? Gene editing is the ability to go into that ladder. All right? Each one of those rungs, the rungs can't just go this way. They have to go exactly with their counterpart and connect to the other side. All right? So they take that, twist it, and here you have a length of DNA. And this length can be starting point, stopping point, and they can change the DNA sequence. What have you done? You've edited it. What are you doing that for? Well, I want a child with blue eyes, or I want a child who's a basketball player, or I want a child who's big in math. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. A man wrote a, a paper 20 years ago, and he said the day will come when very few people have children the way the past generations have had them. They'll go down to the local to the local laboratory, and they'll order up what they want, and they'll get exactly what they're asking for. Now, listen to what your Bible says about that. Listen to what your Bible says about it. I want you to listen to this. 
This is important. In Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Years ago, I've been, I've been at this a long time. Preachers would preach on that, and they weren't too sure exactly what's going on with it. But can you see gene editing in this? Can you see mixing human? Can you see the possibility that this could be used for something like we're talking about here this morning? Yes, you can. Artificial intelligence, it wasn't around 100 years ago. When I came to ministry, it came here years ago, there wasn't anything about artificial intelligence. In fact, there wasn't anything about DNA. DNA was discovered back in the 50s, but I didn't hear it mentioned one time in school because they didn't know anything about it. But DNA now and artificial intelligence now is part of the culture, is part of what you're talking about. And the kids growing up today, it's all they've ever known. If you're, these kids that are in this house this morning, I'm not giving you anything new when I talk about artificial intelligence, but what I am giving you is the possibilities of what lies ahead. What lies ahead. You see, the good thing about, about, being, about being 77 years old is, like our sister said a moment ago, heaven is growing sweeter every day. I could hear a shout at any moment. Amen. And they can't touch me because I'll be leaving out of this world. Now, so artificial intelligence is definitely a marker for me that the Lord Jesus Christ may very well be coming soon. Are you listening? It's not something that's been in every generation. What's the other? Well, CERN, for example. CERN, a Large Hadron Collider. It's, it, it, it connects, it connects uh, Switzerland with France. CERN, quite a remarkable thing. As a matter of fact, they're shooting, they're shooting a substance, particle, around and around at past the speed of light in an environment that is over 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. We're talking about, and there's a point, I don't know where it is, maybe you do, but I've heard it said that you can reach a point below zero where all molecular activity ceases. You might know what that point is. Well, I know this. I know that over 400 degrees, it is, in other words, it's extremely, so what's the point? They want to get it going around and around and around and around and another one around and around and around until, bang, they bring them together. And it's at that moment that they come together, the great bang, they feel like they think that it all started with a bang, the big bang theory. Well, let me tell you something. How God did it's his business, the Bible said in Genesis 1, bara. All right? God created. All right? Bereshith bara Elohim hashamayim ha'aretz. God created from nothing. He brought it into existence. He spoke it into existence. And that's exactly how we got here. But it's quite a thing. Because when you look at CERN, you say to yourself, what are they really going after? How many of you believe what the government says right off the bat on surface? Well, we got some smart people in hallelujah. Amen. So you've learned the hard way that it gets filtered down to you, but it may not be necessary. There may be a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there, the truth, but it's mostly just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. And the truth of the matter, it is. But you see, CERN was built for a reason. What that reason is, I'm not sure, but I know this. I know that it has a potential, and that potential is out there. The man, one of the, one of the first directors of CERN said this. He said, we are opening a door, all right? We don't know what's going to come through, or we don't know what's going to leave here and go over there, all right? Now, this is that thing I was telling you about a few minutes ago, the algorithms. Try to find that on the Internet. Try to find that man making that statement. Now, you, might, you'll, you may have to get a different, you know, there's all kinds of search engines. So you may have to find the right search engine to find that statement. Now, don't you think that's remarkable? Don't you think that they've got a new uh, head of CERN? I'm not accusing her of anything or anybody of anything. But don't you think that's remarkable for them to take that down where you can't find that? Because something may come from over there or go from here to over there. That's kind of scary, isn't it? In plain words, something. We don't know what. 
We're opening a door into another dimension, into another place, and we don't know what's liable to come over here where we are. That's interesting, don't you think? Yes, yes. Did you know they have a statue of Shiva in front of CERN? It was given to them by the state of India. Shiva is one of the Hindu trinity. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Shiva is the great destroyer. It's dancing the Nataraj. The Nataraj is the dance of destruction. Circle, here's Shiva in the middle of it, dancing the Nataraj. The Nataraj is the destruction. The Nataraj has to do with the rebirth of Shakti. So what's Shakti? It's a Hindu word that has to do with life. Shakti, life. Did you know that when someone goes into Kundalini Yoga, they get into the yoga trance, they go into Kundalini Yoga, that a serpent begins at the base of the spine, and it raises all the way up and puts its head over the top of their head. And once it reaches the top, Shakti comes about. You realize that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Shakti is a force of life. Do you realize that there's a lot of other things that have to do with this life that comes forth from the occult world? Are you listening to the fact that there is a lie of life out there somewhere that is not the true life? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Do you realize the Bible said in the book of Revelation, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs go out of the mouth of the beast, the false prophet. Do you realize the Bible said in the book of Revelation, chapter number 9, an angel with a key to the bottomless pit comes down. He opens that pit, and out of that pit comes Apollyon and Abaddon. Both names mean destroyer, Shiva, the destroyer. They come upon the earth, they open up the gates of hell, and the Spirit begins to come out. Did you know the Bible says, He that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way? Did you know the Bible says that the Holy Ghost, and I believe that's the one doing the letting? Letting in the sense of hindering, okay? Let The word let, you have to get your dictionary and you understand how let can also mean a, give a, you know, approval, but it also can mean a hindrance. He that hinders will hinder till he be taken out of the way. Do you understand that you've been given, and this is the grace of God. God is like this. I've learned a little bit about him. He doesn't just spring it on you all of a sudden. He'll give you just a little bit of taste, just a little bit of forewarning, just a little bit to get your attention to, and say, look, look, wake up, wake up. Have you ears to hear? Then hear. You've got eyes to see, see. If you've got a heart, listen, open. I'm showing you th something that's going to happen that you've never seen before here's what it says in first corinthians chapter number 10 but i say the things with the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to idols not to god did i get that right no they sacrifice it to devils well what's the difference between a devil and an idol or a stone or the devil is alive. The stone's dead. So what that means is that what's going on with Shiva, what's going on with when they reach Samadhi, that's where they, the Shakti life force brings them to that point, whether it be Kundalini Yoga or whether it be through that or any other thing, they have reached a point where they are communing with devils. If I don't preach the gospel to you, which I preach, how Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is what the apostle said in 1 Corinthians 15. I declare to you the gospel. Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. And then he rose again the third day. Victor over death, hell, and the grave. He rose from the dead. He said that's the gospel. I've preached that gospel now for 48 years in this church. And I'll preach it till I drop dead or till I'm gone from here. That's the gospel of Christ, not, the, not my gospel, the gospel of Christ. And one of the reasons I preach that is because it is, it, 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 is, it is the power of God against a demon, evil, wicked spirit that wants to add anything or take anything from it. It's the gospel of the grace of God, how Christ died for your sins. So they sacrificed to devils and not to God. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now, here's what it says. Know ye what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? Look at the revelation. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. 
Only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him who's working, who's coming, rather, is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, now this is one more of the things that tell me that I'm living in a generation that has not been before. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but at pleasure and unrighteousness. John said, these things are written that you might believe. Neither cometh they to the light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Do you want the light? If you want the light, the light is there. You live in a country where the light is so bright and blazing, in this house anyway. You're preaching Christ and Him crucified. Oh, how sad for you to come in here week after week. And for the people that are watching, and for those who will watch it later, you know, I'm thankful anytime, whenever. I'm preaching Christ. I may not be around. He may come and get me. We'll be gone. Then who's going to preach? What's going to happen? You're hearing the word this morning. I'm trying to lay a foundation for you. I'm trying to get you to wake up and understand. I know you. they use the term comfort zone. And a lot of people like to stay in their comfort zone. I understand all that. But the truth is you better look out. For things are changing now that are out of your control. And they're changing rapidly. Now, how many's ever heard of dark matter? We've got a pretty good bunch in here. I better not get up here and ram, flim flam around and mumble. Well, I want you to listen to something. This is by Dr. Danny Faulkner. He's on the staff of Answers in Genesis. For more than 26 years, he was professor of physics and astronomy at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster. He's written numerous articles in astronomical journals. His books include Universe by Design. Listen to what this man says about dark matter. Look around at the water, rocks, plants, animals, other humans. Grab a telescope. Take a peek at the planets, galaxies, other stellar wonders. Now squint through a microscope at the infinitesimal world of bacteria, fungi, and other organisms. You could look for a lifetime and still not see everything that is there to see. But incredibly, astronomers, now listen carefully, incredibly, astronomers believe that about 90% of matter in the universe is invisible. They call it dark matter. And you know when I read that, I just said, praise be to that almighty eternal being. He's got a universe out here that you can't even see. And it's right here where you are. Because you see, the Large Hadron Collider is trying to find dark matter. That's one of its jobs, dark matter. Now, here's what he says. And I like honest people. And this is a brother. This is a creationist, physics. He said, so what is dark matter? I don't have a clue. If I did, I'd have a Nobel Prize, wouldn't I? Digest that. The more we learn about creation, it seems the less we know. Dark matter is just one of the universe's mysteries we have to figure out. And there's no reason that a creationist might not uncover the answer, starting with God's word as their foundation. Such mysteries about the physical world should cause us to realize how deep the mysteries of God go. We will have all eternity to probe and continually discover more about God's attributes. For now, our attempt to learn more about his glory by studying his creation is just peering through a telescope glass darkly, a dim picture of the majesty that lies ahead for God's people. <laughs> I don't have him figured out. I don't. I was thinking this morning, I'm sitting on the back porch, watching the squirrels play, listening to the birds. And I thought, what if that's just invisible? Like that right there for, for 
for a moment. And then coming from that invisible world steps a being, a spirit being, pure spirit. And he steps into the womb of a virgin. And in the womb of that virgin, he becomes a man. And then he is born nine months later like all the rest of men. Yet he did not come from here. He came from above. He's the Lord of heaven. And to the angels, the Almighty says, now do you see what you saw? Listen to Paul. Listen to him. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, right? Here's what he says. Which in his time he will show who is that blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man hath seen, which no man can see, to whom be glory, honor, forever and ever and ever. Amen. That means Satan has never seen God in his full, true essence. That means had he not stepped from that invisible world into this world of creation that we know, we would never have seen him. But now all we can know of that eternal being is in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has revealed that Father to us. And to him I say this morning, blessed be our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah to God. Anything else? It's just pure speculation. Forget it. You're not going to impress anybody. Nobody knows the essence of God. But he's, a, he's a spirit being. He's a pure spirit being. But we do know this. We do know he became a man. And 2,000 years ago, that man went to a cross and he died for us. And there he suffered my hell and my torment and took it into his body. And he's laid in the grave. And on the third day, he arose from the dead. Amen. I know God because I know his son. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the little time we've had in your house. Lord, let my life glorify thee. Oh, God, let that happen. Let that be. Let that be. Lord, that would be my highest aspiration. Let my life glorify thee, O oh, Holy One. You know I'm a believer from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I believe. I believe. I believe. And, Lord, help me now. Help me preach your word. Help me minister the word. Open the hearts of the people. Maybe they heard something this morning. A spark just a little bit of interest in their soul that they want to get dig deeper and go further with it. I pray they have. I pray this in Jesus' name now. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen and amen and amen. All right, let's stand up this morning. Don't, don't forget now the 70 weeks of Daniel. This is good. I'm not good at math, believe me. But this thing right here is good. So you want to look at it after the service this morning. All right. Let's stand up and sing. thing about what the apostle said intrigues me so much is when he said dwelling in the light 
which no man hath seen and which no man can see. Imagine a light like that. You remember? Think about it. In the book of Genesis, let there be light. All right. What did he create after he said, let there be light? The sun. You see, that wasn't the sun's light he was talking about. He was talking about an entirely different light. He turned the light on in my soul in 1973. Amen. Praise God, he turned it on. That's why I'm here this morning. I owe him for everything I am. I owe him for everything I am. Amen. I owe him everything. I owe him. Hallelujah to God. Father, thank you, Lord. We know that spirit of hindrance. We know that evil spirit. We know it. We know it. He hates the gospel. He hates Christ. He hates me. But Heavenly Father, you have a work to do, and you'll do it until you call us home. We give ourselves to you. Bless Temple Baptist Church. Let your spirit come upon this place. Bless these dear folk and fill them with the Holy Ghost. Move in this house. Show them the ministry that you'd have us do before we, before we leave here. We ask you to bless now. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right. We'll meet you again this evening at 6 o'clock for the evening service. Get 70 weeks of Daniel. If you like math, that's the stuff right there. <laughs>